Last class, we discussed the first two books of Gulliver's Travels. One dealt with the land of Lilliputians, the land of the little people, who were six inches tall. The next dealt with the land of the giants, the Brobdingnags, who were 72 feet tall. The third book that Gulliver wrote was also a distortion of human nature. It dealt with horse creatures, and we call them whinnynims. The spelling is H-O-U-Y, like, and then H-N-H-N-M-S. Now, one of the characteristics of Gulliver's Travels is that it is a spectacle of verisimilitude. If you look on the screen, you'll see the word verisimilitude. Verisimilitude means it is very much close to the truth. Vera means truth, veris means truth, similar means similar to the truth. And throughout Gulliver's Travels, we have what we call verisimilitude. He always tries to make us think that we are in the present that he is addressing in his letter one of his contemporaries. But there's another characteristic of his works, these three works we've just looked at, and that is that they are characterized as Manipian satire. Now, Manipus was a third century BC, BCE slave in Greece who amassed a fortune lost it, and committed suicide. His works are only available fragmented. But he deals with distortions of figures, distortions of sizes, distortions of people. So anytime you have literature, particularly satire, that is a distortion in many ways, it is called Manipian satire. Now, Manipian satire differs from the satire of Horace, the Latin poet, who laughed at the faults and foibles of men, but didn't distort them. And it's different from the satire of the Latin poet the Juvenal. Juvenal addressed the faults and sins of men with bitter invective, just as the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah did. And so you have the satire of Horace, which is Horatian satire, which is a laughing satire. The satire of Juvenal, which is Juvenalian satire, which is bitter satire. And the satire of Menippus, which has figures in great distortion. And so we're going to look at the third book of Gulliver's Travels, which is actually printed always fourth. But I want you to understand that the three Manipian episodes of Gulliver's Travels were written in order, and then Swift wrote The Attack on Science, which is the third book, which he inserted uh, before the fourth. And there's a reason for it, but I want to speak first about the unity of the first three books, because what we're de addressing here is verisimilitude. If you look at the beginning of the fourth book, Gulliver is home on September 7, 1710, but on May 9, 1711, he chooses to sail on a ship, the adventure, for which he is now captain. Now remember, in the portions of the novel that are considered verisimilitude, Gulliver in English circles has promoted, been promoted from a surgeon's mate to a surgeon to a first mate, which is his characterization in the third book, to captain. And the apogee, the highest point that you can arrive at in English maritime life is the role of captain of the ship. The captain of the ship is control, in control of the ship. The captain of the, sh the ship shares in the profits of the ship and therefore Gulliver was off on a voyage that he thought would be quite profitable to him. 
And so we have the statement, I continued at home with my wife and children about five months in this very happy condition. If I could have learned the lesson of knowing when I was well. And now you have the anticipation, what went wrong. And that's one of the characteristics of this verisimilitude. You know something's going to go wrong. I left my poor wife, big with child, and accepted an advantageous offer, made me to be the captain of the adventure, a stout merchant man of 350 tons. So now he leaves his wife pregnant, does not return again for five years until December 5th, 1715, when he returns home. Gulliver, of course, is captain of the ship, but he is subject to mutiny. He has to stop off and pick up new sailors to refresh in his fleet, his uh, crew. They mutiny against him, and a James Welch is the leader against him. Gulliver is put off in a small boat and forced to sail wherever he can find safety, and he finds himself on an island where he sees horses who are essentially in charge of this civilization and animals that look like human beings who chase up a tree and pelt him with feces. Now again, this moves into the scatological nature of Gulliver's travels. Uh, people have written about Gulliver's obsession, his Swift's obsession with human flesh and with human waste. Now one of, the re uh, one of the realities, of course, is that Jonathan Swift is an Anglican priest. You don't find religion mentioned very much in Gulliver's travels, at least not overtly. He's not preaching to you what he believes. But in the fourth book of Gulliver's travels, he is telling you that man is basically bestial in nature and that in a world that doesn't understand religion or in a world that pays no attention to religious values you're likely to find man in his most deskable state and in his most dishonored state. And these figures who chase people from the treetops who pelt them with human waste are called yahoos. Now the question is where does Swift get all his names? Well the word winning them we're not sure where it is but I guess he came up with a metonymy that suggested that if you uh, sound the name of the horse's whinny and put it into a multiplication of HNs and uh, nasal sounds, you will get the horse's name. But where did you get the name Yahoo? I'm going to make a suggestion to you, which is a, uh, relatively interesting, and I want you to understand that this is the religious connotation of Gulliver's Travels. Now, the word Yahweh, which is the English translation of the Tetragrammaton, the four holy letters of Hebrew, is the common expression for God's name in the New Testament and in other sources, in cases where people don't want to use the Tetragrammaton. Swift, we know, knew Hebrew. He had studied Hebrew. Because he was an Anglican priest, we know that the Brobdenagian alphabet consists of 22 letters, which is the same as the Hebrew alphabet. And I've already pointed to you that certain words that are uttered by the Lilliputians when they captured Gulliver, Baruch Mevola and Shekhinah Degel, are, can be translated from uh, Hebrew terms. But what you have to understand is this that the Hebrew letter V, let's go down, the Hebrew letter V 
is pronounced vav or has a v sound. But when it has a dot on top of it, it is pronounced like an o. And when it has a dot on the side of it, it is pronounced like an u. So that you can look at this word and you can say Yahweh, but you can also pronounce this as an u sound where it becomes Yahoo. Now, the Yahoo certainly aren't God. And that is a really important statement because they are bestial, they are animalistic, they are fouled, and they try to attack Gulliver. But the important idea is that when we are introduced to the Yahoos, we find out that their real name is Ain Yahoo. Now Ain means not, not in the Hebrew language. So these are not God. And what you have is really the inverse and obverse of the religious spirit in these bestial creatures who are yahoos. Now, there is no other interpretation for the name yahoo. And this is where it's derived. When you hear, when you hear people being called yahoos today, it comes out of Gulliver's Travels. No one's inventing a new word. So when you begin to look at this novel, you'll discover, number one, that the yahoos are the lowest form of life because they are the opposite of the spirit. Secondly, when Gulliver becomes identified with the yahoos, he suffers shame. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. Because the whole nature of the fourth book of Gulliver's Travels is the denial of human dignity, the denial of the human worth, and the recognition that human beings are ultimately going to go back into the dirt. Now, we know that Gulliver, that Swift, in many cases, is misogynistic. Of course, here we find that he is offended by the pride of man. And by reducing man to the state of yahoos, we have a denial of a human spirit. Now, the point is that we've got to find out now how it is that man, or the Englishman, is to be denied spirit. And this happens in several ways. First of all, we have to, again, engage Gulliver's discussions with the Winningham Master. And when you contrast what the Winningham Master says and what Gulliver says, you don't trust Gulliver. I told you again. And I'll repeat. In the first book of Gulliver's Travels, we trust Gulliver's word. In the second book, he is emasculated. And we no longer trust Gulliver as the word of truth and the word of wisdom. And certainly in the fourth book, every perception of Gulliver is really a distortion of uh, human values. Now let's look again at the discussion of the winning the master with Gulliver. Turn to the fourth chapter of Gulliver's Travels. And he begins to discuss English life. At one point he's explaining to the winning a master this horse figure, what his life is like. And he says, I said my birth was of honest parents in an island called England, which was remote from this country, 
that I was bred a surgeon whose trade it is to cure wounds and hurts in the body got by accident or violence. That my country was governed by a female man whom we call a queen. That I left it to get riches where I might maintain myself and my family when I should return. That in my last voyage I was commander of the ship and had about 50 yahoos under me. So Gulliver himself makes the connection, differentiating himself from the horse. He said, many of them died at sea, and I was forced to supply them by others picked out from several nations. Finally, he said, among these were fellows of desperate fortunes, forced to fly from places of their birth on account of their poverty or their crimes. Now, once Gulliver mentions that many of these sailors were forced to leave their homes because of poverty, we now understand a disparate relationship between those who can sail to gain riches and those who cannot. What, he says, has victimized these people is a litany of the crimes of society. Some were undone by lawsuits. They had money, but they were bled dry. Others spent all they had in drinking, whoring, and gaming. Others fled for treason, many for murder, theft, poisoning, robbery, perjury, forgery, coining false money, for committing rapes or sodomy, for flying from their colors in the army or deserting to the enemy. And most of them had broken prison. None of them dared return to their native countries for fear of being hanged or of starving in a jail. And therefore, were in, under necessity of seeking a livelihood in other places. Well, for the winning a master whose people have no passion, and whose people have no knowledge of crime, whose people are horrified by the English custom of castrating horses and gelding them for race tracks. The winning the master asks more questions, and every question probes and demonstrates the faults of the society that Swift is attacking. During this discourse, my master was pleased to interrupt me several times. I had made use of many circumlocutions in describing to him the nature of several crimes. These crimes were so heinous that he didn't want to really state them. He kind of circuited them. This labor took up several days of conversation. Now, what is it the king asks? He wants to clear up some ideas of the desire of, for power and riches. Why do people want power? Why do they want this money? And we're reminded of Moore's utopia where the only people who held gold were prisoners in chains. This was their punishment to possess gold. He wondered about the terrible effects of lust, intemperance, malice, and envy. All this I was forced to define and describe by putting up cases and making suppositions. And if you were to write about any of these problems in English society, you would go to the gentleman's magazine, or you would go to books on famous criminals, or you would go to Gulliver's Travels to find out what types of crimes committed in our time may be equated with these crimes that horrify the winning and master in his time. He was amazed. He says, power, government, war, law, punishment, and a thousand other things had no terms 
wherein that language could express. And so if you don't have words for amazement, indignation, power, government, war, law, punishment, you may not have to carry out any of these effects. Now we're going to talk a few moments about the nature of perception. Because when the winning of master says he has none of these vices of society, he is saying that we don't see them. This becomes essentially impossible if you understand Locke's theory of understanding, which says that we all learn from our perception. We all learn from what we see, from what we know, from what we identify by our hearing, by our touch. This is called sensational behaviorism. Our sensations tell us what we know. Swift didn't like Locke in psychology because it interfered with orthodox religious thought. If, in fact, you were inspired by divine law, if you were inspired by the divine word, then you were governed by a higher body. But if your perception it was really based on all that you only saw and knew and heard, then of course you are limited by man's perception. There are two ways man perceives anything. One is directly. How do you learn love? A mother kisses a child. How do you learn hate? A mother turns away from another being in anger. These are physical, psychological, perceptible actions. How do you learn fear? You walk on an elevator with your mother, and as the doors close, her warm hands now become cold and clammy. Something has changed in her demeanor. She's claustrophobic, and she hates being in a closed space, and she's fearful, and the child feels it in her hand. That's how you learn, not because people necessarily tell you, but because you see them act. So what you see and perceive becomes your initial perception. But most people learn medially. We don't learn from what we perceive directly. We learn from words which represent objects we have not seen ourselves. So words become medial. And consequently, when the Winningham master says, uh, we have no words for war, that means they have not seen war. We have no words for power, that means that they have a communal type of government where everyone shares and everyone has the benefits of the society and the natural life that they live as horses in this environment. They have no words for law. They don't need law to govern, to dictate, to give you property and take away property. People are all part of this system and they share. So not having a need to enter into any of these negotiations, they have no words for any of these terms. We don't uh, uh, live in the Arctic regions. So we only have one word for snow or several words for snow, but they have 13 or 14 because snow in different representations has different names. We don't experience snow in different transformer formations and therefore we have no separate words for snow. Now, in Chapter 5, Gulliver again is on the, is under attack. The master at Gulliver has explained everything he can. He believes in his English life. He sees no alternative to his English life. His England is now becoming an imperial nation as a result of the Treaty of Utrecht of 1713. 
English ships are all over the world and Gulliver had hoped to be to enrich himself by being the captain of one of them. And the master then begins to ask him questions about the life that he described. He asked me what were the usual causes of motives that made one country go to war with another. I answered they were innumerable, but I should only mention a few of the chief. Sometimes the ambition of princes, who never think they have land or people enough to govern. Do we have in the 20th century or the 21st century people who are trying to grab land as the basis for their power? It's happening in Africa amongst tribal nations. Sometimes the corruption of ministers who engage their master in a war in order to style or divert the clamor of subjects against an evil administration. Some governments will declare war, frighten people by the war, build an army by war, so that they can hide the internal corruption, they can hide the riches that they themselves are earning, they can hide poor social services, they can hide bad economic policy, they can hide efforts to force religion on the state, on people who don't want to worship in certain ways. What are other causes of war? Differences in opinions have cost millions of lives. Differences of, of opinions. What are those opinions? For instance, whether flesh be bread or bread be flesh. Now here we have the difference between transubstantiation under the belief of the Catholic Church and uh, constant, uh, consubstantiation under the belief of the Protestant Church. Whether the wafer and whether the wine actually become the, bud, the, the blood and the body of Christ. So you have internecine wars and in Gulliver's day a Roman Catholic France was oppressing the Protestant Huguenots who were fleeing to Russia, uh, fleeing to England and fleeing to America. Whether the juice of a certain berry be blood or wine that's again the issue of transubstantiation. Whether whistling be a vice or a virtue. Whether you can sing by the Gregorian chant or whether you can chant in your own way. Whether you can say prayers by the Book of Common Prayer or by other types of prayer books. Whether it is better to kiss a post or throw it into a fire. Does anyone have any idea what that would mean? Well, who knows? A post may be a crucifix. A post may be a religious sign. Are you going to observe it or are you going to destroy it? Are you going to burn down the temples? Or are you going to see them raised, uh, uh, built? What is the best color for a coat? Black, white, red, or gray? When the Roman Catholic Church, when the, uh, Henry VIII separated from the Roman Catholic Church, there was an effort to modify the costumes of the bishops and the costumes of the popes, the costumes of the priests. And even today, the surplus that people wear in church and the garb that people wear becomes an identifying factor of which religious sect you belong to. And so, you have this continuous and sustained attack upon English life and the corruption of princes, the fighting between nations, the denial of the human spirit, and nowhere do you see anyone with any real 
religious purpose. Gulliver looks at the naivety of the winning and master. The winning and master says that he cannot understand the trade of soldier because a soldier is a Yahoo hired to kill in cold blood as many of his own species who have offended him as possibly he can. Now the species of course is Yahoo. The differentiate are the uniforms people wear and the countries they represent. Now Gulliver gets excited. He says, this man doesn't know anything about warfare. He doesn't know about the great inventions we have. He says, Gulliver says, I could not forbear shaking my head and smiling a little at his ignorance. And being no stranger to the art of war, I gave him a description of, here we go, this is the epic list. Cannons, culverins, muskets, muskets, carabines, pistols, bullets, powder, swords, bayonets, battles, sieges, retreats, attacks, undermines, countermines, bombardments, sea fights, ships sunk with a thousand men, 20,000 killed on each side, dying groans, limbs flying in the air, smoke, noise, confusion, trampling to death under horses' feet, flight, pursuit, victory, fields strewed with carcasses left for to dogs and wolves and birds of prey, plundering, stripping, ravishing, burning, and destroying. Gulliver gets excited. This is what he's all about. I assured him that I had seen them blow up a hundred enemies once in a siege and as many in a ship and beheld the dead bodies come down in pieces from the clouds to the great diversion of the spectators. But you're watching this outside. I was going on to more particulars. I'm going to tell them how this happens. Why well, I'm spending billions of dollars for weapons. I was going on to more particulars when my master commanded me silence. He said, whoever understood the nature of yahoos might easily believe it possible for so vile an animal to be capable of every action. So vile an animal, he characterizes the human species. Well, you have to remember that at the Battle of Vienna in 1683, as I've told you before, which ended the Turkish movement, the Muslim movement west, 4,000 foreign troops were killed in a single day and 7,000 Muslims. It wasn't unusual for this many deaths to occur in the battlefield in a major battle. There were no, there was no penicillin to cure people of the wounds. And there was no Red Cross to remove bodies from the battlefield and bury people in honor. Gulliver goes on with more. What is the nature of lawyers? You, in the same chapter, you begin to get Gulliver's discussion of lawyers. Who are these lawyers? There is a society of men among us, bred up from the youth, in the art of proving by words multiplied for the purpose that white is black and black is white according as they are paid. They will take any side of an issue and turn it around depending on who pays them. To this society, all the rest of the people are slaves. The lawyers govern you. The lawyers control you. The lawyers deny you. And the lawyers profit from you. 
And he gives an example. Just listen to the case. For example, if my neighbor hath a mind to my cow, he hires a lawyer to prove that he ought to have a cow from me. I must then hire another to defend my right, it being against the rules of law that any man should speak for himself. Now in this case, I, who am the right owner of this cow, lie under two great disadvantages. First, my lawyer being practiced from the cradle, Uh, all right, number one, my lawyer being practiced almost from his cradle in defending falsehood is quite out of his element when he's asked to be an advocate for justice, which is an office unnatural to him. Well, you can't get any more sarcastic about lawyers than Swift does. Your, 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 your lawyer, who is going to always take the false position, isn't going to defend someone with truth because he doesn't know how to do it. The second disadvantage is that my lawyer must proceed with caution or he'll be reprimanded by judges who then won't give him more cases. And therefore I have two ways to get back my cow, he says. The first is to go to my adversary's lawyer and pay him a double fee to work for me. He will then betray his client by insinuating that he has justice on his side. The second way is for my lawyer to make my cause appear as, as unjust as he can by allowing the cow to belong to my adversary and judges who always decide the contrary will then give me back my cow. Now, how bitter can you be? How satirical can you be? How strong can be the invective against lawyers? Well, we have people who object to lawyers today, but I don't know that they in any way express themselves with the bitterness of Jonathan Swift. Now, if we were to proceed to study this particular phase of Gulliver's Travels, we could go into a number of other details. But there are two points I want to stress. Number one, Gulliver tries to keep on his clothes because he realizes that if he takes off his clothes, he's going to look like a yahoo. On one occasion, his master sees Gulliver lying naked asleep and he's shocked to see what looks to be a yahoo. Confirmation comes later. And what is the confirmation? Confirmation comes when Gulliver is bathing in a stream and the winning a master is watching him, trying to protect him, when a female Yahoo jumps in the stream and tries to mate with Gulliver. Well, only animals of kind mate with each other. And this becomes the final confirmation that Gulliver is more a yahoo than he is a Winningham. Ultimately, the Winninghams decide that this race of creatures is too befiled, too foul to maintain, and they choose to annihilate the yahoos. This is a case in literature of an attempt of a people to eliminate an entire race that they find undesirable. It took the 20th century to find a nation in Germany that wanted to eliminate the entire Jewish nation and bring to reality what was only a fiction in the 18th century. Again, I say it's a great to be out of the 20th century, the bloodiest century in the history of this world. Gulliver then is allowed to escape. His winning master shows compassion for him. He puts, Yah he puts Gulliver in a canoe. The canoe is uh, made out of Yahoo skins and Gulliver escapes and returns home. 
But when Gulliver returns home, he refuses to live with his wife. He refuses to live with his wife. She is a yahoo. He wants nothing to do with her. He prefers to live in the stable and live amongst the horses. It takes him almost nine months to move back into his house. And we can only assume that Gulliver is mad. The 18th century believes in what we call social concourse. You've got to come together as people. You've got to be part of society. Once Gulliver is separate, separated and separates himself from his family, he is mad. And the ending of Gulliver's travels is the, conclu the only conclusion that Gulliver has gone mad and that Gulliver no longer is stable. Gulliver no longer can be trusted. And his human condition has so been disparaged. His life has so been wasted. His morality has so been humiliated or uh, uh, undermined that you cannot even assume that he, has sense, that he has his senses at the end. And this is the end of Gulliver's Travels. I don't think there's another interpretation. And what Swift is saying is once you proceed without the spirit, and once you deny human values, then there's nothing left. Now we move to the next book of Gulliver's Travels, the third book which was done last, and that is The Attack on Science. And I'm going to spend uh, the remaining amount of time on this particular text. There are two points I want to point out to you. As soon as this turns up. I got it on, thank you. The computer went to sleep. I'd already mentioned to you that when we talk about thought and knowledge in Gulliver's Travels, we're dealing, among other ideas, with John Locke's essay concerning human understanding. John Locke says that there are no innate ideas. Everything is a blank page when you're born, and you add to this page your knowledge from your senses. So sensational behaviorism is Lockean philosophy. It is basically an anti-religious point of view, because religion tells us we are born with innate ideas given to us by the divinity. Says Locke, ideas all come from sensation or reflection. Once we see objects, we reflect upon them, and we become knowledgeable. Simple ideas come from the senses, right? You uh, uh, have the sense of touch, and then you begin to touch the difference between steak and lamb and vegetables and carrots, and you begin to understand differences. Simple ideas come from the senses. Uh, you may see a sun and you may see the sky and then you become a Van Gogh and you turn them into whirls so that your simple ideas come from the senses and turn into imaginative ideas. And it's a very important idea to understand the sensible idea. Now, Swift, I want to tell you, objected to Lockean psychology. He said this is too simple. We do have an ide innate ideas. We do have an inner spirit, which Locke denies. And consequently, you're going to see some examples of the attack on sensible knowledge in 
the third book of Gulliver's tra tra Travels, which is an attack on science. All perception arises, says Locke, from organic impression, what you see and understand from your organs. And what you retain is your contemplation or your memory. Locke also talks about words. He says language is imperfect. We use words, but they can, it, they can often very not describe precisely what we mean for them to say. And demonstrative knowledge is the mind's perception of the agreement or disagreement of ideas. All knowledge comes from senses. It is sensitive knowledge. So the ideas of John Locke are one point that you ought to look at, and I'm going to look at another philosopher that you have to recognize or know something about. And that is George Berkeley. Now, George Barclay, born in Ireland, remember Swift is Irish, but because he was born there, but his family was from England. Barclay was native Ireland, born March 12th, 1685. We can celebrate his birthday when March 12th come up, comes up. George Barclay is a major philosopher. He wrote a number of books. One was an essay towards a new theory on vision. And it's very important to know his idea and vision. You may want to read this essay because he talks about how people see objects and how people's minds distort or alter these objects to their own perception. He also wrote a book called Three Dialogues of Hylas and Philonus in 1713. He also, in 1744, wrote a book on tar water, for which he is famous. He actually, in 1728, married Anne Forster and sailed to Newport, Rhode Island. And in 1734, he was appointed Bishop of Klein in Ireland. Bishop, even though he was younger than Swift, Swift admired him and spoke with a, uh, some interest in his work as a priest, but... He disagreed, and he uses some of uh, Barclay's ideas. Now, let me just mention to you this book. Three Dialogues of Hylas and Philonus. Barclay is an Anglican priest. He becomes an Anglican bishop. He believes in religion. He also believes in the philosophy of John Locke. The problem is, how do you... Maintain your religion while believing in Locke's philosophy. Now remember, Locke, when he wrote his essay on human understanding and his essay on education, never, never would have thought that his philosophy would undermine religious thought. He is a believer in God. He is not a, uh, in any way an iconoclast. And yet his philosophy essentially did undermine uh, doxology and dogmatic law, church law. In three dialogues of Hylas, remember the statement, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it fall, did it make a sound? And did it fall? Well, that's where that issue appears in three dialogues of Hylas and Philonus. And the answer is a Simple one. It's a Lockean response in a religious way. Barclay says, we create things as human beings. We grow little plants. We do our jobs. We make things better for our family. We build houses. We have our way of doing things. And we do this because we have a soul. We have the capability to invent and devise. He said, but the greater world, the world of mountains, the world of trees, the world of nature, who has created that? Someone who has a larger soul than we have, and that's the oversoul. And for Barclay, the oversoul is 
his belief in God. And so, when a tree falls in a forest, and no one hears it, it's no human being who hears it, but obviously the father who created and built this tree and designed the tree and is father of all of nature, he hears it. And that's how Barclay resolves this soul and oversoul problem and tries to give a religious bent to Lockean psychology. Philosophically, it's not a strong argument. But then Barclay comes up with another idea, and that is this. He says, remember, Barclay was living at a time, or he was born when the microscope had just been invented by Lavenhoek. And he says, what we see is not always what we, what we understand is not always what we see. And what we see is not always what, what is there. He says, take a tulip. Reduce it to a thin slice on a microscope. And look at this tulip. And you don't see the streaks. You don't see the redness. You don't see the flower. You see a completely new set of perceptions. And the tulip you were aware of is a totally distinctively, a distinctively different object. So when you look at a tulip, you're looking at something that may be deceiving you because looking more deeply into it, it's a far different vegetable or object than you might perceive. And then he offers another example. Take the example of a cherry. You know what a cherry is. It's a piece of fruit. You bite into it and it's luscious. But take away the pulp. Take away the color. Take away the roundness. Take away the seed. And you no longer have cheriness. You no longer have the object you're looking at. Consequently, we're often deceived by what we see. Now, to this kind of argument, Swift was, uh, uh, Swift didn't understand this type of argument. Swift was not a philosopher. And so, the third book of Gulliver's Travels is essentially anti-science. And there are reasons I'd like to talk about right now. First of all, let's mention uh, the beginning of the third book of Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver, again on a voyage, finds himself at sea. He's involved in a ship uh, 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 a situation where he is afloat and finds himself on a land called Lindalino, on a land on Bonabarbi, and there's a floating island above him. A floating island above him. A floating island above him. The island is ruled by a king who chooses to oppress the nations below. And those nations below, sometimes he deprives of water, of rain, sometimes he deprives of sunshine by floating his island above this, these people to oppress them. The island is called Laputa. Laputa in Spanish means the whore. On the island of Laputa are philosophers. They are abstruse philosophers who have one eye looking into the sky and one eye looking at the earth, and they are really disorganized. Their wives are so unhappy with them that they sneak into Barnabarbi to live amongst men who beat them and punish them. And the philosophers go looking for their wives and they discover that their wives, though they're beaten by these Bonabarbians, don't want to return to their husbands because at least the Bonabarbians pay attention to them. But philosophers don't pay attention to their wives. 
One nation, one nation, one city, excuse me, one city is able to defy the island of Laputa. And those are the Lindalinians. I want you to write that down. Lindalino, L-I-N, D-A-L-I-N-O, Lindalino. Now, who are the Lindalinians? Any, are any of you uh, capable of working out puzzles? What's unique about the term Lindalino? Anything? If you were to break down the word, what combinations of syllables would you find that you might find interesting? And he guesses. Press your button, the first person. Press your button and tell me whether Linda Lino has any unique characteristic about it. Are there any word, any syllables that repeat themselves? Lin. Lin. Right? How many Lins are there? Two, right? Now, remember Swift is Irish, right? So two Lins are a double Lin. Ireland is the representation of Bonabarbi, and the land of Laputa is England, and Swift is objecting to the way that the English have oppressed the Irish. What do the Lindalinians do, these people from Dublin? They've erected four towers who have magnets on them, and when the king of Laputa tries to lower his island, he finds that the Magnets around Lindalina are dragging him down and will crush the adamantine surface underneath his island. And so he stays aloof from them. Showing how Swift himself has somehow on occasion kept the English from passing laws to oppress the Irish. And we find this in certain other documents we're not going to discuss today. The satire on Ireland becomes quite clear. Now, there is one person who can build constructively in the land of Bonabarbi. His name is Lord Munodi, M-U-N-O-D-I. He represents Swift's friend Bolingbroke, who was the secretary who fled to France after the Treaty of Utrecht. Swift actually went to Walpole and asked to have Bolingbroke returned safely to England. Bol uh, Walpole refused at the time, but eventually Bolingbroke came back. Uh, excuse me, one point I forgot. Why is Swift interested in islands with magnets? Make your analogy. In 1727, Sir Isaac Newton died. And Swift was aware of the scientific discoveries and scientific inventions and the ad ad attitudes and ideas of magnetism and gravity that Sir Isaac Newton expounded. And so the attack on science in the island of Laputa and the land of Bonabarbi is not so much, uh, it is also an attack upon Newtonian science. Gulliver then finds himself proceeding to the Academy of Legato. I want to move on to the Academy of Legato, because the Academy of Legato is the land of science. And in the Academy of Legato, he meets certain types of scientists. One of them one of them is studying uh, how to take human waste and turn it back into food. Now, this man has not been visited by others for many years. When Gulliver comes into his laboratory, he embraces Gulliver, and Gulliver is offended by the stench. Can you turn human waste into food? Is that such a possibility? Mr. Dickerson? Mr. Dickerson here? Okay. It doesn't sound likely. It doesn't sound likely. Press your button. 
What did you say? It doesn't seem very likely. It wouldn't be a, a healthy idea, I, I wouldn't assume. Right. You're at the University of Houston, right? Do you know that you're at the Univ Academy of Legato? The University of Houston is involved with Texas A&M and the University of Texas in trying to figure out how to handle 60 ton of human waste when we have populations of 100 to 1,000 people on the moon. How do you get rid of this human waste? You cannot send it back to Earth. And so, there are pods of scientists working at NASA, the National Space Agency, who have human waste and who are trying to figure out ways to grow hydroponic foods or foods from human waste. To use the nutrients that come out of human waste. We're conducting those experiments today. We're involved in a NASA proposal. We are the Academy of Legato. Another experiment, yes. Some people have said that uh, the whole thing of having uh, a base on the moon is to have a, like a floating island with which to bombard other nations on the earth. <laughs> Absolutely. And the Winnie the Master, the Bob Nagin King, would expect such uh, vice and such a uh, turns of events to occur. Let's take another one. The Academy of Legato wants us to take sunshine and bottle it so that heat can be used in the winter to heat homes. And all you have to do is take the sunshine's heat bottled in the summer and have it available in the winter. Ms. Mortimer, Ms. Mortimer here. Ms. Schilling. Can you bottle heat and can you store it and have it available? You can produce it, but I don't think you can. I don't know if it would be possible to store it. Mm -hmm. well, I, mean, I mean, they do. I mean, uh, like batteries, you know, store energy, but I, mean, I don't know. Again, you're at the University of Houston and you're at the Academy of Legato. At least 15 years ago, scientists at the University of Houston designed the solar tower at, uh, in, in California where 1,000 heliostats shone the sun's heat onto a tower filled with liquid sodium. The liquid sodium heated up and ran tubes to run 13, the energy for uh, the energy generating plant for energy for 1,300 families in California, near the deserts in California. And this solar tower uh, then was further developed to store heat. These liquid sodium tanks would store heat during the night so that when the sun wasn't shining, you could get heat to heat, heat and electricity for these 1,300 homes. So the University of Houston, if you look in the Encyclopedia of Science, you'll see the University of Houston as the designer for the first solar tower power device to generate electricity for homes from sunshine. So again, you're at the Academy of Legato. Now, what you have to understand is that SWIFT drew all his experiments from the Royal Academy. All experiments were being conducted by scientists in his time, and he drew them. Just as science fiction writers today don't design their own inventions, they look to see what, what the scientific papers are producing, and they use these as the basis for their scientific inventions that seem quite forward, quite advanced, but are undergoing research in laboratories throughout the world. Let's move on. There are two other episodes in Gulliver's Travels that we want to look at. One is the visit to uh, 
the land of the sorcerers, Tribnia. And the other is the visit and the discussion of that race of people, that race of people who can live forever. First of all, Let's uh, look at the land of Glubdubdrib. If you go to the land of Glubdubdrib, you'll discover that Gulliver has taken us to the land of sorcerers. This is the land of magicians. And if you go to the land of magicians, you can call back from the past anyone whom you wish to call back and whom you wish to discuss life's matters with. You, in the land of Glubdubdrib, you will be able to speak the language of the people whom you wish to meet. And we discover certain anomalies. Gulliver wants to call back the philosopher Socrates. And he discovers that Socrates doesn't know any of his critics. And none of his critics know Socrates. And so this is Swift's satire on modern learning, again as with the tale of the tub. That critics who claim that they know an ancient writer, critics who pretend to be the voice of an ancient writer, Critics who pretend to translate an ancient writer, in fact, are misled, misinformed, and providing the fiction rather than the truth. This is Swift's skepticism about knowledge. We look at the knowledge of a uh, Hannibal. Hannibal was said to have crossed the Alps and to win his victory over the Greeks. But in order to get over the Alps, he had to break stones apart. And the myth is that he would pour alcohol into the cracks of the stones and then heat up the alcohol and would split the rocks. And Gulliver learns that Hannibal never had alcohol in his camp. His soldiers were disciplined. They were not drunkards like common soldiers they were accustomed to. But imagine, there, there, are, there are numerous stories in the 18th century, uh, dialogues with the dead. A man by the name of Littleton wrote a number of essays, and you could actually write a research paper on dialogues of the dead. Mr. Steinberg, if you were to bring someone back from the past whom you really wanted to discuss matters with, someone whom who you wanted to understand and whose world you wanted to have explained to you, whom would you call back from the past? Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, good. Uh, and what would you have asked Leonardo da Vinci as Gulliver tries to ask uh, Alexander and Hannibal, Brutus, Caesar, Cato, Epimonides, Junius, Socrates, Descartes? What would you have asked Leonardo da Vinci? What inspired him? What inspired him? Now what you did was very good. Number one, you selected a name that everyone in the class would know. Just as Gulliver has selected a name that most of his readers would know. You can't select someone obscure. Secondly, you've asked a very good question. What inspired him? And wouldn't it be a surprise if he said, look, I needed to buy a piece of bread tomorrow. So I had to come up with something new that someone would buy from me. You see? What a surprise you would get when inspiration had to do with a man's hunger rather than a man's innate ability. But I'm sure uh, you're right. So the inventiveness of Gulliver's travels stems from this point. I'd like to now turn to the issue of the Strolbrugs. Go to the Strolbrugs. The Strolbrugs are immortals. 
And what do you know about the Stirlbrugs? There's a great deal that we're not covering, but you have to know about the Stirlbrugs. Chapter 10 leads us to the Stirlbrugs, and these are immortals. When a child is born with a red circular spot in his forehead, he is identified as a Stirlbrug. And people are horrified. What is a Stirlbrug? A Stirlbrug is a person who is born with eternal life. He can never die. Swift. A Gulliver is excited when he hears about these Stirlbrugs. He says, I freely own myself to have been struck with inexpressible delight upon hearing this account. And the person who gave it to me Happening, happening to understand the Barnabarian language, which I spoke very well, I could not forbear breaking out into expressions a little too extravagant. What does Gulliver think about these Strollbrugs? I cried out as in a rapture, happy nation, where every child has a chance of being immortal. Happy people who enjoy living examples of ancient virtue. Happy people who could have a judicious prince who could be provided with advice by his great, 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 great grandfather. You could be the richest person in the world. You could be the wisest person in the world. You could be the most beneficent person in the world. You could be the most powerful person in the world if you were immortal. And Gulliver learns that this spot on the forehead turns green at youth, blue in middle age, and black as you move toward old age. Now, this is the exact direction of the rainbow. If you, go, you, if you move your colors, Vib Gyor is violet, indigo, blue, yellow, green, orange, and red. Those are the colors of the rainbow, exactly as they're explained by Newton in his book on optics. Remember, he put a prism in a window and saw the colors shine against the wall. And he maintained and discovered the colors of the rainbow. So the colors that enunciate themselves on the head of the cereal drugs are equated with the rainbow. But what Gulliver learned is that the Stirlbrugs grow old and become immortal and grow older and older and older. And they never have eternal youth. So they live forever, but by the age of 80, they're senile. And they cannot recall the events of history because they can't remember anything but being carried on the shoulders of their father to see the king when they were youngsters. They can't handle money because they have no values anymore. And they can't stay married because no man should have to live it into eternity being nagged by another person. They even learn that because language changes every 200 years, they can't even understand people who died before them and are still living because there's no communication. Try to read Chaucer today. Some of you can. Most of you cannot. Try to read Old English. Some of you can. Some of you can. Try to read Greek. Some of you can. Some of you can't. But language changes and consequently it becomes an impossibility. I told you that Gulliver's Travels is an attack upon the lack of religion or spirit. The Barnabar, the, the uh, uh, Stirlbrugs become the last element, one of the major elements. 
that demonstrate Swift's pessimism about human belief when people lack spirit. And who would ever dream to be an immortal except someone who's stupid? Because men cannot be immortal. They will die. Gulliver's Travels is an amazing book. I hope you have a chance to read all of it. Thank you.